Good morning or good evening, depending on what part of the world you are in. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. First thing first, as always, we do hope that you are all well and healthy in these difficult times. Uh, these really are difficult times. And in the middle of these difficult times, we are grateful to our colleagues at the Independent Evaluation Office of the IMF to join us today, the Asia School of Business and the C7 Center here in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, to talk about the latest report by the IEO on the IMF's advice on capital flows. I understand that we have a number of policymakers uh, in the call today. Uh, we would love them. We would love them to join us with their questions or comments. Uh, I am Özer Karagedikli from the CSEN Center. I will do this with minimum intervention. Uh, and I would like to start with Prakash Longani from the IEO first. Prakash, may I pass the mic and camera to you, please? Thanks very much, Özer. Uh, thanks very much to CSEN and to the uh, Asia School of Business for hosting us. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so um, as Ozer said, this is a, a new report that we uh, released in, in, in September on the IMF's advice on capital flows. Um, people in this audience are uh, an informed bunch, so you will know that in 2012, the IMF adopted a so-called institutional view to guide its advice on how capital controls could be used along with other tools to deal with capital flow volatility and uh, to proceed with capital account liberalization. Um, at the same time, the IMF also enhanced its macro prudential framework. It enhanced its ability to reach assessments of whether exchange rates are fairly valued. And it enhanced its uh, uh, toolkit to decide whether countries have adequate reserves. And the purpose of our report is to see whether this full set of uh, initiatives that the IMF conducted over the past decade have uh, led to an improvement in the advice that the IMF gives to countries on capital flows. Uh, our report consists of um, country cases. We do 27 country cases, a mix across the spectrum of income groups. And we have several thematic papers written by well-known experts. So to get to our findings, our finding on the IMF's advice on capital account liberalization is that there is broad appreciation across the IMF's membership for the advice that the fund has been given has has been has been giving on the pace and sequencing of capital account liberalization in the 1990s the imf was perceived as pushing for capital account liberalization on a somewhat uh, faith based or ideological basis as opposed to an evidence based uh, support but the feeling among our membership is that over the past decade, it has largely been cautious uh, in pushing for capital account liberalization. It has emphasized issues of pace and sequencing um, adequately. Um, we do some case studies of Ethiopia, Kenya, and Morocco, which kind of confirm uh, the general impression that we got from talking to the membership. Uh, of course, not. Every country feels fully satisfied, but I think this is the broad sense we got. Um, in fact, from some of our case studies, particularly for China and India, there was almost a sense that the IMF had become too cautious, that it failed to exploit opportunities for pushing for uh, capital account liberalization when it would have been of assistance to the countries. On the other hand, Argentina represents a case where the IMF may have been too hasty in uh, not cautioning against uh, the fact that uh, withdrawal of uh, controls without adequate uh, 
macro framework uh, would have been could have been a cause for trouble down the line. Turning now to our country advice on managing volatility, again, um, the, our sense from talking to many in the membership is that the IMF deserves credit for upgrading its framework for advice in 2012 uh, and in the years that followed. Um, practice and theory had started to outstrip IMF's advice, and so the 2012 upgrade was a much needed one, and uh, countries feel that uh, IMF staff have tried hard to make advice consistent uh, across countries, tailored and even handed. That said, um, about a decade later, after this major overhaul, I think we are once again at the point where uh, evidence from countries and theory are have put up have put put things at the point where the IMF may once again need to revisit the institutional view and carry out another uh, uh, upgrade of, of the framework. Some of the issues that we have found that are militating against uh, IMF influence and value added are uh, the institutional view does not allow for preemptive views of capital controls. And the case that yeah, the institutional view makes for this is not uh, convincing to uh, some country authorities, particularly uh, in the region uh, that we are uh, speaking to now. Um, uh, many, many countries feel that the discussion of capital controls has become tied up in labeling issues that is crowding out the space for real policy discussions of what instruments are needed to deal with the situation at hand. And third, um, the role of foreign exchange intervention is not fully being acknowledged in fund advice, the fact that it's needed, the extent to which it's needed, the problems that it uh, poses uh, are not fully uh, acknowledged in the institutional view. So moving to the first issue, um, many countries feel that the preemptive and long lasting use of capital controls for financial stability reasons is something that is helping them and they don't see why the IMF's institutional view comes, comes out against that. Uh, that we survey many countries and Korea, for instance, Peru, Iceland in 2016 are all examples where they have been able to use uh, sort of capital controls uh, preemptively as part of their financial stability framework. Uh, ASEAN countries have issued a policy paper some years back, also making the same case. Um, and in fact, the IMF's own integrated policy framework suggests that there are conditions such as when uh, foreign exchange markets are shallow, when countries are facing currency mismatches on their balance sheets, uh, when uh, the use of capital controls along with other instruments can be actually useful. Uh, for financial stability reasons. And when we spoke to private investors, they too saw that uh, use of capital controls on certain occasions can actually be beneficial to a country uh, in containing financial stability risks. The second issue is labeling. Um, the IMF has these three sort of categories, three buckets. Uh, one is capital controls or CFMs, measures designed to limit capital uh, inflows, uh, capital flows. Uh, MPM, which are macroprudential measures, measures designed for financial stability. And then there's this third category, which is CFM slash MPM, which is measures designed to limit capital controls and safeguard financial stability. Um, you will see on my screen that there's a uh, a Venn diagram, which is so complicated that it would take me an hour to try to describe it and I would still fail. It would take uh, smart people like the people whose faces you see on the screen uh, to figure this out. So it's a very complicated system that has been set up to decide what goes in what bucket. And yet um, making these fairly delicate decisions uh, can lead to a fork in the road in IMF advice. So if after making this complicated uh, 
decision, you reach the judgment that something is an MPM, then you can use it preemptively and keep it on permanently. And the IMF will, 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 will say that's fine. But if at the end of this complicated decision process, you reach the judgment this, that this is actually a CFM slash MPM, then the IMF will tell you, well, yes, you have a little bit more room, but you have to take it off. You can't keep it in place uh, forever and you can't use it preemptively. So deciding which measure falls where, where on this Venn diagram something ends up has basically become uh, the, 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 the content of Article 4 discussions in many cases, instead of really thinking about what is the set of policy instruments that countries need to deal with the situation at hand. And an illustration of this is when countries have used capital controls to keep housing affordable in their countries. So these measures have been used in Australia, Canada, Hong Kong, New Zealand, and Singapore. These are all countries that consider themselves as flag bearers for open capital markets. And yet uh, they have gotten into uh, some trouble with the IMF because the IMF has said that you are imposing capital controls uh, when these countries actually feel that they are imposing uh, measures that will keep housing affordable for their local citizens and they are not really trying to have a measurable impact on, on capital controls. And finally, the third issue is the role of foreign exchange intervention. I think that the country experience and recent research suggests that um, foreign exchange intervention can play and is playing a much bigger role in countries' policy toolkits than is fully acknowledged in the IMF's uh, systems. Um, in fact, the thing that the IMF advocates as the first line of defense, namely exchange rate movements, can sometimes be a shock amplifier rather than uh, a shock absorber and work done in the region and in fact work done by the IMF's own Asia Pacific Department reported in the Regional Economic Outlook supports this view. So um, the, the point is that what the IMF advocates as the first line of defense um, does not always work in, 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 in every circumstance and in fact can be counterproductive, suggesting that other tools such as capital controls and foreign exchange intervention may be needed uh, to fully insulate countries from the possibly damaging effect of effects of capital flow volatility. Another point is that the advice on capital controls rests on, uh, on uh, assessments of exchange rate at, um, uh, valuation as well as reserve adequacy which countries have not found fully convincing. So even though these measures have been enhanced, they are better than they were a decade ago, uh, countries still don't fully buy into uh, the results that come out of these uh, metrics. So, you know, out of the 27 or so countries that I, I mentioned we studied, uh, in, in, a, in a third of the cases, there have been some disputes about exchange rate value or the adequacy of reserves. Uh, the countries are listed on that slide. Um, I think the IMF's engagement with Korea uh, illustrates many of these points. Uh, Korea has been using reserve requirements on foreign currency deposits uh, fairly actively. Uh, the IMF agrees that these measures have been effective for financial stability, but nevertheless calls them uh, in this category I mentioned, which are joint capital controls and macroprudential measures. And because the IMF puts it in this bucket, the IMF is then forced to say, well, you have to remove these measures, even though um, the IMF has not been able to suggest alternative measures that would be just as effective. And so this illustrates the fact that Korea would like to keep these measures in place for a long time and to use them preemptively. But under the I IMF's present institutional view, uh, the IMF cannot go along with this. And at the same time, as I said, the IMF is not 
able to suggest alternatives that would be just as effective. Um, one thing in the case of Korea is that um, you know, th there is some concern about whether capital controls are being used for, uh, for uh, influencing the value of the exchange rate. So if that is the case, the IMF does have other instruments such as the external balance assessment uh, to make that case. Uh, it doesn't have to, the institutional view does not have to be the instrument through which that message is delivered. The IMF has other tools. And finally, um, I won't have time to go into this in, in any detail, but you know, th there are other uh, multilateral frameworks out there, notably the OECD's uh, code on liberalization of capital account movements uh, and uh, reconciling that with the IV, with the institutional view uh, has, has proven to be a delicate exercise. Uh, it, it has been managed, but uh, going forward, it would be good to try to institutionalize that. So our main recommendation is that, as I said, in 2012, uh, the IMF deserves considerable credit for upgrading its framework to bring it into line with practice and theory. I think the time has come uh, about a decade later to again make sure that the institutional view rem remains a state-of-the-art framework. I think the IMF should think hard about whether or not there is a good case for ruling out preemptive and long-lasting use of capital controls for financial stability reasons under some well-specified circumstances. We should acknowledge that some countries are using capital controls for guaranteeing housing affordability for their citizens and that this was not recognized when the IV was designed in 2012. And it should recognize that capital controls can sometimes increase macro policy space, particularly when, disrupt, uh, when, when dealing with disruptive outflows. We have other recommendations that talk about enhancing the research that the IMF has engaged, has been engaged in, notably on the integrated policy framework. As I mentioned, we think that there's a need to uh, have a framework in place to uh, have continued cooperation between the IMF and the OECD on issues of capital account uh, liberalization. And um, we are very sort of gratified that we had a very good discussion with the IMF's executive board on September 18th. You will be not, you will not be surprised to learn that there were a variety of views among the IMF's executive directors, but there was broad support for the idea that next year's review of the institutional view uh, cannot just be a rubber stamp saying everything is fine. It needs to take into account many of the issues that we have brought up and which have been brought up by the IMF's, IMF staff's own integrated policy framework research. Uh, so let me uh, stop there thanking again uh, CSEN and uh, Asia School of Business for their uh, support of this of this venture and, and i look forward to hearing the views of uh, hans and others thank you thank you very much prakash uh, yes what a difference a decade can make in the advice or the economic thinking that we have on the issue while we are still on the io report can we go to hans Kenbeck from asia school of business because hans was involved with a particular chapter of the io report hans Thank you very much. I shall attempt to share my screen as well. Uh, so, my contribution to the uh, this uh, uh, evaluation consisted of writing a background paper on, uh, in my case, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, the use of the authorities and uh, the advice the IMF had given. There's uh, the pa background paper itself that you see the front page of. Well, it also contains the, um, the, the case study on Korea written by Luke Everett. But I will talk on uh, what I know better, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. But I should mention that, in fact, the conclusions and the suggestions uh, that came out of Luke Everett's chapter or section on Korea is quite consistent with what we heard from the authorities 
in, in the other three countries. So why Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand as a, as a group? Well, they share a number of common characteristics which uh, make them uh, interesting as to look at as a group. They, they are subject to large swings in capital flows, have been for the many years now. They, they do have flexible exchange rates since the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s. But uh, they do intervene in the foreign exchange market on occasion. All three of them do, and they say so. Uh, they have less than fully open capital account. The usual measures uh, that have been produced in the literature, the Dijura measures by Chin and Ito and others. And, but also on some measures of de facto openness, one can tell that uh, less than the, their capital accounts are less than fully open. And they also make use, these three countries make use of macroprudential policy make, uh, measures. Uh, they, East Asia, in fact, was, uh, or Southeast Asia was one of the early countries that adopted macroprudential um, policy measures in the early 2000s. And uh, some of these measures rely on, um, on um, or relate to capital flows, I should say. Now, for those of you who may not be uh, fully uh, aware of how these evaluations work, it's useful to just spend a little bit of time saying, at least in my case, when they do country studies, how these uh, come about. The, uh, there is, of course, a time period, and as, as Prakash mentioned, it's post-institutional view, and in my case, it's principally from 2015 about onwards the, uh, that we looked at, that I looked at. And when to determine my advice, uh, there are two sorts of, of uh, evidence or information. One is the Article 4 staff reports that come out each year after the mission staff mission visits the country and talks to the authorities, principally the central bank, and uh, the, uh, the uh, finance ministry. And I also spoke to a certain number uh, of IMF staff, mission chiefs in, to these uh, countries, and staff who worked on, on the uh, economies. When it comes to the, uh, the authorities' views, what um, uh, again, what I relied on was the comments of uh, the authorities on the staff report, which are also always included in the published report. I also met with the uh, office of the executive director for Thailand and the, the, all the three countries, their constituency at the fund. And uh, I met with uh, country officials at Bank Indonesia, Bank Nagara, and Bank of Thailand. So that's the information. Uh, now, why do we move forward? Sorry. In terms of high level findings uh, out of this information that was gathered for, for this background paper, four points, three points I want to mention. One is that the authorities felt that the IMS was too rigid with respect to the use of foreign exchange market intervention, capital flow management policies and macro potential policies. That rigidity is almost built in to the institutional view in the sense that it is, it is relatively hierarchical in nature, nature in terms of uh, when you can use uh, foreign exchange market intervention and these other tools. Um, Authorities felt quite strongly in all three of my countries that the uh, work of uh, that there was a hope that the inter work on the internet rated policy framework would lead to a more nuanced analysis of country uh, policies and advice that was more country specific. And uh, one of the comments that just stuck through my mind was uh, that uh, one of the officials said. If the uh, integrated policy framework uh, turns out to be just uh, the institutional view 2.0, it would be very, very disappointing. Now, let me take uh, a little parenthesis uh, to mention that if you're interested in, in more on the institutional view and the IPF, 
you can view a recording of a webinar that we had uh, in our series on conversations on central banking, a webinar where the former governors, uh, Jose de Gregorio of the Central Bank of Chile and uh, Veritai of the uh, Bank of Thailand discussed uh, these issues and that can be found on, on our ASP website. The third high level finding is that uh, the uh, authorities felt that the funds treatment of capital flow measures and, and uh, macroprudential measures was too legalistic. Uh, Prakash already alluded to that. And it, uh, the advice didn't take it account of the rationale and objectives of such measures. Rather, it relied on the complicated Venn diagram that Prakash mentioned. Now, let me mention a few specifics. On exchange rate, uh, the, um, the, the advice is typically that uh, the flex a flexible exchange rate should be the first line of defense. And interventions in the foreign exchange market should only be uh, undertaken to moderate excessive volatility or bizarre orderly market conditions. In fact, that, that line is, uh, the sentences to that effect are almost, uh, almost always in the, the staff report. And it uh, almost, com almost comes across as being kind of a, a uh, phrase that you put in without really thinking a whole lot about the implications. The problem with the authorities, according to the authorities with that, is that there is no uh, discussion of the exchange rate as a possible shock amplifier or shock transmitter, as opposed to a shock absorber. Prakash already mentioned that. And uh, there's also very little advice or no advice on what constitutes excessive exchange rate volatility. So there's very little uh, that would help, according to authorities, would help them make better decisions. Now, in uh, sp some specifics concerning CFM and NPM, uh, capital flow measures and macro potential policies, uh, the advice is, is very much uh, along the line of encouraging the use of macro potential policies to deal with financial stability risks. But there is a there is a dichotomy in the advice as well, in the sense that the IMF suggests that NPM should be used for st financial stability risk and monetary policy for monetary stability issues, and uh, the two can be sort of separated from each other. And finally, uh, the advice also discourages the use of capital flow measures. Now, the authorities find problems with uh, some of these. And uh, with respect to the second uh, set of uh, advice mentioned, second bullet point, the authorities argue that macroprudential policies have monetary stability consequences because it affects credit conditions and so on. And monetary policy has financial stability consequences. So. You can't really separate the two. They, they must be used in a coordinated fashion and not in some sort of hierarchical fashion. Um, the authorities also feel that they have introduced capital flow measures to deal with financial stability risks and should not, therefore not be, or should therefore be classified as and uh, macro potential policies. And as, as Prakash explained, they think that the IMF view is too legalistic. And I should mention in this regard that uh, some of the mission chiefs agree implicitly, uh, if, if not explicitly, that uh, there is a problem of, uh, of uh, classification. And they feel uh, sometimes uh, constrained by the review process that happens when the, the the uh, staff report is produced, a review process that happens at headquarters, which uh, relies strictly on the uh, institutional view framework. Um, now, and, and they also make the point that, that the practice of frowning on re-imposition of capital flow measures once they have taken away, that 
means that the authorities are reluctant to remove them in the first place. So in that sense, capital flow measures may stay on after they have been judged to be not to be necessary because authorities want to be able to have them as a, as a safeguard. So the overall assessment of, of uh, in this uh, background paper, uh, the fund uh, analysis according to the uh, authorities and their policy uh, advice is not judged to be uh, pro providing much value added or, or influence on the policy choices that, uh, that the countries are, uh, need to deal with in, when they are challenged by volatile capital flows. Now, the, with respect to the capital flow measures and the macro potential measure, measures, those are contingent on uh, the advice is contingent on an assessment that it's not a sub substitute for macroeconomic policies. So the authorities feel, though, that a more integrated and less hierarchical policy framework should be needed. Uh, in other words, capital flow measures should not be sort of the last last resort after everything else has, has been tried. Um, as Prakash also mentioned, there's a lack of clarity on how the fund determines whether a currency-based macroprudential measure is also a capital flow measure. So for these reasons, country officials have become increasingly, in, in my three countries, frustrated with IMF advice on capital flows. And it shows in their comments on the uh, on the staff report, and uh, another uh, comment that I heard from an official, which uh, uh, sort of indicates that frustration is that uh, we simply uh, ignore IMF advice on these on these issues because we don't find it uh, having much value added. So let me leave it there, but just give you three references. Those who in, are interested in these issue, issues. The, um, the institutional view in 2012, a paper that was recently issued uh, discussing the integrated policy framework work that was presented at the board, and the, the um, paper by the ASEAN countries that, um, uh, that uh, also deal with these issues and, and to present an alternative to the institutional view. And Prakash mentioned that. And finally, of course, uh, you should all read the uh, capital flow report. And honestly, and I don't, uh, I don't uh, pretend that you necessarily need to read my paper, but you should read all the others, background papers. They're really, really good. There are some uh, country papers that are very good and also thematic papers that are excellent. So let me leave it with that. And thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Hans. Uh, now uh, we have heard uh, the IEO papers about IEO papers. Now let me turn the microphone or camera on to ASB and CSAN staff to deliver their views on the, the IEO report or the IMF's views in general, or also on the recent integrated policy framework put out by the IMF or the draft uh, work that's been going on. Anela Munro from the Asia School of Business will go first, and then Ole Rammel from the CSAN Center. Thanks for the invitation uh, to be part of this um, session. Um, I want to talk about three things. One, just a brief um, couple of comments on the report. I think Prakash and Hans have uh, covered that well, so I'll just be very brief there. Um, and then I want to comment a little bit from more of a theory perspective, and I know Ole is going to comment more from a, a practical implementation uh, perspective. So um, to think about what models we have as a basis uh, for policy advice. Um, the bottom line is really our models are not great with capital flows and asset prices, which are closely linked. Um, I'll talk in more detail about that. And then where are we going? Are we there yet? How are we progressing? Um, and then just tell a, a short risk sharing story, which is sort of maybe more advanced models, which is thinking about risk and risk sharing 
um, and thinking about this kind of model as a, as a testing ground, not as the right model. There's no right model. We'll never get the right model. It would be too complex, um, but just as a way of, of testing some of these policy proposals. Okay. So the IEO uh, report, I think, is a really valuable report. Um, it documents the evolution of IMF advice, views of the IMF uh, from a focus on uh, sort of financial account openness and capital account li uh, liberal capital flows uh, to a more nuanced view that admits um, externalities um, and, and other complications. Um, simple to more nuanced. In views of uh, borrowing current, in it, it documents the views of borrowing currency authorities. Hans talked um, about that. And especially the disagreements, which I think is really important because there's a lot we don't know in this space and a lot of views at the table um, is, is a positive thing. Um, and also detailed country experiences, um, often events lead analysis and we really need those detailed experiences um, to be documented. So I think it's a really useful view of the landscape, how things have changed. Um, and multiple perspectives, and really credit to those in the IMF who pushed for and implemented the change, and also to the country authorities who resisted advice that wasn't right to them um, and, and were part of the conversation. And I think that's a really healthy way to go forward. Um, so events do typically precede analysis, and uh, on the other hand, policymakers often need to make decisions in real time. Um, and this is a particularly difficult area. So country authorities are, are packed sometimes of capital flow surges and outflows and currency or often the effects of just really strong current flows. Um, IMF policy is, is uh, looking for a consistent framework for engagement um, that balances the benefits and the costs of capital flows, but that weighting is really difficult. We don't have the answer to that. So there's some judgment that needs to be made, and it's trying to make a, a, a manageable, consistent framework out of something complex. So that's sort of their challenge, and IMF staff trying to apply this, um, you know, simple framework that's consistent for all into different and, and complex situations. So just to acknowledge that um, this is not easy for all of those involved. Um, but again, chronicling the experience is important for both advancing the framework and enabling um, the analysis. So what's the model underpinning the advice? Well, I don't think there is a particular model. There are many models. People say they're all wrong, but some are useful. Um, the basic underlying presumption is, is that capital flows provide substantial benefits, which is kind of an easy one. You know, we want capital to go to where it's most productive. Um, outflows um, can, can lead to macro and financial stability risks. We've known about these for a long time, so that um, they often involve risk and amplification. So how do we weight these two things and how do we respond? Um, it, it, it's not an easy question that's being asked here. Um, I mean, I guess it all was originally based more in an ISLM framework. So we have aggregate demand and aggregate supply and we have some open economy effects, um, which is uh, a very simple framework that doesn't deal with a lot of things and modeling has progressed so it's just kind of think, remembering how we have progressed. As Air mentioned, how we come in policy advice, but also in terms of the analytical tools that um, we have. And I'm going to focus on the theory side, and the empirical tools obviously have come a long way as well. Um, so in the 90s, we kind of had a consistency framework. It was mostly reduced form, but accounting identities added uh, discipline. And then with DSGE models in the 2000s, there's a lot more discipline that's quite useful in this space because it gives intertemporal discipline. So if you do something today, it has implications tomorrow um, that you have to deal with um, all the way through future, the future. And the micro foundations mean that other agents in the model are going to respond to what you do, often um, 
reducing the effect of what you do and sometimes washing it out completely. So that's a, another kind of discipline on how we look at the effects of policy, which is what we're talking about here. Um, as D DSGs have developed, they've more sophisticated with frictions, externalities that amplify factors, but they're not really second order models is my understanding. Um, and in the all, before the 2020s, but I'm going to say in the 2020s, we're going to get a lot better at the nonlinear models and have really a deeper understanding of risk and risk sharing, which is absolutely crucial to these kinds of exchange rate and capital flow um, dynamics that we're looking at. So in a typical macro policy model, um, how do these things work? Well, typically monetary policy interest rates are going to drive the exchange rate. Um, there might be an exogenous uh, shock on the exchange rate. Um, and then trade and the elasticities of trade are going to adjust. The trade balance is going to adjust. Debt service is going to respond to uh, the interest rate change. And we're going to get a current account and the capital inflow is the current account deficit. So capital, our, our framework, they're much more driven on prices than quantities. The quantity is a little bit um, more uh, second, I mean, it, it follows, right? And so unless we get the exchange rate adjustment right, um, and certainly the exchange rate response to monetary policy in our models is consistent with what we see um, in the data. And so Ozer, for example, is uh, an author on one of the uh, event studies that looks at that. And it is what monetary policy is supposed to do through UIP does pan out in the data. It's just that that's a really small part of exchange rate uh, variation. So then in the finance literature, we have these models that are more partial equilibrium, um, maybe two periods. They have really rich nonlinear dynamics. They have coordination failures and risk, but they're not general equilibrium. They don't have macroeconomic policies. And so we, we have one place where we deal with kind of the complications of nonlinearity and risk, and then another place where we deal with in a linear, more linear framework where we deal with these policies. Um, and we know from the finance literature that really most of the variation in asset prices, exchange rates is one, um, it, it has to be variation in risk, risk appetite under a mild set of assumptions. So are we there yet? These together? Um, well, people are doing that. It's not as easy as just combining them and pressing go because they're much more difficult to deal with and, and to interpret. Um, but I think there is progress and I, I, I don't think well, there will be one model. It's just building different kinds of models and then maybe testing out these different policy uh, frameworks in, in different um, environments. So I just want to tell quickly a paper I don't it's just there there are many uh, papers and Rika Mendoza has some um, papers that deal with um, some of these things all together although probably not the, the three policy side this one tries to and this one again doesn't have uh, monetary policy but it and it's a really complicated paper to read but it has a nice uh, just sort of intuitive story about it so it starts with two types of countries there's the center and the periphery so the center um, has production or trade linkages that expose interlinkages to each other, let's say, to expose them uh, to global risk. That's the kind of system risk that you can't classify away. And so that's really the risk that you care about. Um, so ex ante, those countries are really by away that system or global risk, um, whereas have precautionary savings motive, they save more, they have lower interest rates. Countries, and uh, in the presentation I went to of this paper, which is an earlier version, they talked about countries like Australia and New Zealand, but we could think of it as um, some uh, small economy, some emerging economies, although they're going to be a whole lot of additional uh, low rated economies, other risk factors we need to think about. But they have risk that can be diversified away. So um, before there's any, they're less risky 
because they don't have that global risk. They can diversify away. So they don't have uh, precautionary, such a strong precautionary savings mode if they have higher interest rates. So then we let these countries have capital flows between them. In normal times, high return, or sorry, from a low return to a high return um, to capital, um, investors in the center are going to diversify their portfolios. They're going to have an out capital outflow in a weak currency, and periphery countries are going to receive capital inflows. They're going to reduce interest rates and um, capital inflow put downward pressure, and they're going to have a strong currency. So, or at least downward pressure on the risk component. Um, then we have a global risk event. What's going to happen? Investors in the center are all going to pull back their capital to rebuild their balance sheets. Their currency is going to appreciate. The periphery is going to have a capital outflow, rising borrowing costs, a depreciating currency, and they're going to potentially have a liquidity problem. So, if we think of it in this kind of framework, um, and for some countries, this is probably not a, a, a bad interpretation, whether it's right or wrong um, remains to be seen of the kind of repeated bouts of inflows and outflows. But I guess one lesson is you have to set yourself up for these repeated outflows, outflow events, and think about how you want ex ante. So in this kind of framework, how would, how would the uh, IMF advice go down? So much of the standard policy advice, I think, would make sense. You know, we don't want to have foreign currency debt uh, because then we get into the standard problem um, of emerging economy or any economy with foreign currency debt. That when you get that capital outflow phase, you're stuck between do I keep interest rates high to stop my debt blowing out or do I lower interest rates to support the economy? Um, so there are a lot of sensible things. This is a short list. I'm sure there are a lo long list of things that make a lot of sense. But in this kind of model with risk and risk sharing, I think an important question we have to ask is, are these periphery countries in a position to share the aggregate risk? Um, certainly they're not if they have foreign currency debt. Um, so, okay, they can develop local currency debt markets, and a lot of countries have been very successful, at least in the sovereign segment of doing that, maybe not so much in the corporate bond section, segment. Um, if even if you don't have foreign currency debt and it's all local currency debt, um, you still are faced with a big liquidity problem with that outflow. So is your domestic lender of last resort up to the, the liquidity problem that you're going to face? Um, if this capital inflow is in the form of debt contracts, um, I think we have to think particularly careful about is that country in a position to share the aggregate risk? because this is an aggregate risk event well, by definition, right? Um, and so we can think of things like equity and long-term debt, but should we also think about capital flow uh, restrictions if maybe equity and, uh, I mean, obviously it can be policy dependent, country dependent and risk dependent, but if you don't have um, contracts, funding is a capital flow uh, measure going to help you get that kind of stickiness that you would get from more stable funding. And I, I do, I, I really agree with what Hans and Prakash said earlier that, um, you know, when, when we're thinking about these as short term in the face of a surge or more medium term effects, I think there is a case for if you're going to use this to get that stickiness until you can get a long term debt market, for example, then uh, it's probably good to be transparent ex ante and let investors, when they make the investment decision, know that that uh, capital outflow um, is going to be subject to it early on. Um, and I think we, we can think about FX intervention potentially in a little bit of a different way of not so much of um, exchange rate influence, but this is now an asset, foreign and local assets are now changing their risk profiles over the cycle. They are seen differently by local and foreign investors in terms of their risk profile. For a, a resident, local currency debt is not risky. I want to match, match my assets and liabilities. But for a foreign investor or a non-resident, then local currency debt is risky. So we would expect to have different investment patterns. So that could happen through private 
or it could happen through in boom phase, um, a fiscal surplus going into foreign currency or FX intervention as sort of a natural investment response to changing uh, risk profiles. So my, my point here is not this model or a particular model, just we need to think about risk and risk sharing and changing um, risk um, profiles over time. So are we there yet? I think there's still a lot of perspectives which speaks to probably not. Um, I think analysis of historical episodes is really important to deepen understanding and having a lot of um, as this report has brought people together is really a valuable one. Um, I think theory is improving, empirics are improving as well. We're getting a better understanding of risk, uh, but I think we still have a long way to go in, in having the analytical tools to really provide some definitive answers on these kinds of things. Um, so that leaves us with policy under uncertainty, which probably speaks then to the kind of caution uh, that Prakash was talking about earlier, uh, an appropriate um, step in the right direction. And uh, just to say my, my point here is not to beat up on model people or the IMF or anything, just to kind of acknowledge that it's really a difficult and complex area that we, we don't have the answers for yet. And um, so I'll leave it there, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you to uh, the organizers for inviting me to present uh, some comments on the um, um, IEO's report on IMF advice on capital flows. I mean, I know that the organizers, the, sorry, I know that the, um, that the IEO just finished this report, but in a certain sense, I'm already thinking ahead to the update of this evalu to the update of this evaluation report. So many of my comments, um, they're, they're, they're not necessarily mine. Some are already contained in the report. Prakash mentioned a lot of them, but I wanted to emphasize those that struck me as especially important going, going forward. So let me motivate, sorry, let me, let me motivate um, my my comments by, you know, just reminding uh, all of us that financial globalization has thrown up a large number of questions, issues, policy challenges, whatever you want to call them, over the last uh, couple of couple of decades. I'm not going to go through all of them, but off the top of my head, I I could only think of nine but there are probably plenty more and we have some 50 odd people on the call. So each one of you can think about your own preferred capital flows issue that you are facing. The, the reason I, I bring this up is that as Anella said a minute ago, um, providing advice on capital flows is tough. And I think this is one of the many contributions that, that the report makes that it's, it makes it clear how difficult any advice on capital flows is, uh, including the IMF advice on capital flows. And for reasons I'll, I'll, I'll outline as we go through my, my couple of slides here, this is true both in theory and in, in practice. Now, let, let me point out that, apologies for the noise you hear in the background, there's the ventilation in, in the building. I hope you can still hear me. It's, it's going to go out in a, a second or two. But um, let me just start by saying how much I enjoyed reading the evaluation report. It's very rich, it's informative, it's a valuable contribution, it's very important, and above all, it's quite self-critical, uh, which is, is very welcome. Now, let's start off with a sort of a, a perfect world scenario of a Goldilocks setup. And in a perfect world, we would have steady capital inflows, just of the right size, of the right kind. And uh, is, this, is this sort of uh, feasible? Um, we know, um, and the report outlines the capital flows volatility. Hans talked about the volatility um, of, of, um, of capital inflows. Um, do we know what, what the appropriate amount of, cap, of capital is 
probably not. Can we control the, the, the type of, uh, of capital inflow? Well, to a certain extent, we know that capital controls or capital flow management measures can steer capital inflows towards FTI and away from footloose portfolio flows, but they cannot really control the size of inflows. So all of these objectives, these, these sort of Goldilocks scenario should be achieved within a consistent and transparent policy framework. You know, um, we shouldn't take recourse to unfair foreign exchange interventions and what my British colleagues would, would call dodgy capital controls. So this is the kind of perfect world. And obviously we are miles away from being anywhere close to this perfect world. And as Prakash had mentioned, for the past two decades or so, in practice, what we've seen, and Hans brought that out as well, is that the practice of managing capital flows around the globe has generally been ahead of theory and not always in line with consensus or ideology. So let me turn to some of the implementation issues. So in future, the next the next IEO report on capital flows will be a sort of updated, revised, combined institutional view with the integrated policy framework that Anella just outlined. And we know that this is happening next year. So this is a, a major step forward. Indeed, the whole IPF, I think, is, is a major step forward. It recognizes to a much greater extent, the real life pressures and constraints facing the, the majority of IMF, IMF members. So as uh, my, my colleague said, this is theory catching up with uh, practice. However, we also know that for the time being, the IPF is still not granular enough to match the full spectrum of IMF members, but in the IMF's defense, it is only some five months old. So the publication of the three papers underlying the IPF was only in June or July, if I remember correctly. Now we do know that, uh, and uh, I think Hans mentioned this, um, the, oops, sorry, um, uh, we do know that uh, one of the uh, limitations of the in institutional view is that it tends to view capital account regulations as interventions of last resort, rather than as an integral part of counter-cyclical macroeconomic uh, policy. Now, what happens if we have the revised, updated, combined IV? I think there are a number of uh, implementation issues. The one having to do with the on the ground. Um, we, we've already had one ongoing attempt to do that in many central banks, which is to get macroprudential policy under the same wing or as or to, to, um, to fuse uh, macro, uh, macroprudential policy with, with monetary policy. We still don't have a sort of the best practice in terms of the organizational setup but now imagine that we have the revised IV um, that, that also includes, that includes foreign exchange interventions, uh, monetary policy, um, capital flow management measures, and macroprudential policy. Now, in terms of the implementation at central, this may well require significant institutional, operational, analytical and governments, uh, governance changes. Do central banks have the analytical uh, um, capacity to analyze all of these, these issues at the same time and within the same framework? Are there legal issues in terms of impl implementing uh, all of these, um, implementing this um, uh, integrated policy uh, framework? Um, uh, other sort of gov governance uh, governance issues that uh, you know who's in charge of all of these what's the coordination of all of these all of these issues there's enough talk about central banks being the only game in town and assuming all these unelected powers i think the ipf and the implementation of the ipf 
uh, within central banks um, is going to be a big, may require a big shakeup of the central banks, and not only within the central banks, but possibly across government um, more broadly. We know that in some countries, foreign exchange interventions is the purview of the Ministry of Finance. Um, now, with within the integrated policy framework, um, how how is that how is that going going to work? But the implementation rests not only with the uh, with the central banks. I think there are also issues having to do with the IMF itself, in particular. Um, future capital flows advice puts the onus on the IMF as well in terms of fully internalizing the IV and the I and the IPF. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, is the average if there is such a thing, IMF desk, desk economist aware of the IMF, uh, sorry, IPF. Um, you know, has the IPF or the, the combined, the revised IV and IPF, has that percolated to the average desk economist? Would an Article 4 delegation in the future need to include an IV IPF specialist? Or can it be handled by uh, the regular um, uh, the regular uh, de delegation members? So I think there's a you know there's a bigger onus on on the IMF now as well to to provide a more holistic IMF advice on capital flows within this new updated uh, IV that that's going to happen uh, next year. Uh, you know I have full faith that the IMF will be able to do that, but I'm, I'm just sort of raising, raising the possibility here. Um, I will also, there's, there's also uh, the issue of um, uh, basically that this, the, the, the IV IPF is untested. Um, the IMF is rolling it out at the moment. Um, there may be transitional issues who's you know who who will be the first uh, country to you know to sort of do this or uh, who's going to go first in terms of being assessed um on how well the integrated policy uh, framework uh, works and this is especially important in the sense that um policy making in general it should be market friendly it shouldn't raise country risk premia it shouldn't deter market developments and you know the sort of best case scenario is that policy makers clearly signal what set of instruments they plan to deploy to deal with capital flow volatility and that they avoid negative surprises well the ipf or the iv ipf is untested um to what extent can policy maker clearly clearly signal what they plan to do when they themselves are trying to work out the institutional arrangements and the practical arrangements and the operational arrangements of um, of this new new type uh, IV and uh, IPF. So I know that there is, uh, I mean, obviously the IMF is well, is well aware of this, but more analysis on the medium to long term experience with the revised IVF is undoubtedly warranted if and when we have the experience with the revised institutional view. And the same goes for the identification of possible unintended consequences. Let me just pick up one or two issues that are contained within the report. And uh, Prakash mentioned it sort of a little bit, which is that uh, there's a discussion of focusing or IMF focus on more dimensions of capital flows in particular distributional, social and political aspects. I don't, in my own, uh, I don't know whether this is really helpful. It raises a whole range of issues, starting with, you know, more targets, more instruments. So we are already trying to incorporate these four new instruments into the IPF. Are they enough to sort of deal with um, deal with distribution, deal with all of these aspects? If they aren't, there will be trade-offs, and 
what are the trade-offs if we try to, to, to sort of tackle distributional or wealth issues and who should make them? Is it the IMF that really should, should sort of tackle um, distributional issues within a country? And I've just, just this morning, I went to the IMF's website. You know, what does the IMF do? Well, the IMF promotes, and the emphasis is mine, promotes international financial stability and monetary cooperation. It facilitates international trade. It helps to reduce global poverty. So this sort of aspect on distributional, social, political aspects, it may be contained somewhere in here, um, but is it in fact sort of slow mission creep? And is it in the IMF's interest to take on these additional objectives? You know, the IMF hasn't always been everyone's favorite in, uh, international institutions. And I don't know whether the IMF wants to become a pawn for domestic politics in the sense of a government saying, well, we wanted to redistribute wealth, but the IMF told us that, that, we, that we couldn't. Quick point on uh, capital account liberalization. On balance, I would agree that it is more important to get the sequence right and not to liberalize too early, but I very much urge the IMF to address the questions that are outlined in chapter five of of the, of the IMF report. Um, we've, we've spoken about this uh, already, so I, uh, I can be brief uh, in the benefit of time. Um, this sort of inconsistency in the treatment of macroprudential pol uh, policy measures and capital flow management measures, Prakash talked about it. Many of these issues are either inconsistencies across international policy institutions and standard setters. They appear to be in the process of being ironed out, but I think there's a, a more, more that needs to be done. And I wholeheartedly support the ongoing efforts to settle this really confusing distinction. I mean, in theory, I have full sympathy for the IMF for making this, this, this distinction between Macroprudential, mon, mon, macroprudential measures, capital flow management measures, and the CMF MPMs. But in practical terms, I think it's more confusing rather than uh, helpful. And let me finish off with a very old chestnut, which I know is not going to happen, but let me just, just raise the issue nonetheless. And this is yeah, sort of uh, uh, the, the Nirvana of global cooperation. We know that um, uh, um, we know that there are spillovers from certain core countries to the periphery. The, the, um, the institutional view uh, wants to pay attention to these negative spillovers that can happen. They are borne out by the theoretical results in the IPF. Um, I know this is a non-starter, but in terms of capital flow advice, is there a way of the IMF providing capital flow advice to source countries, not only recipient countries? And there was some sort of quite light, light touch um, uh, um, proposals some of them included in, uh, in, in, the I, in the IEO report, such as the adoption of an international regime, determining which regulations are appropriate and which are not, and maybe a code of good practice for capital account policies. Let me stop here. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or have a, a, good, a good discussion on some of the issues that were, that were mentioned. Thank you, Ole. Uh, may I pass uh, uh, the microphone to Prakash if he would like to respond to any of those, but may I add one particular question, Prakash, if you don't mind, especially in the light of the IEO's report last year on the issue of diversity and inclusion, diversity in terms of diversity of thought, 
is there any chance of sort of combining that with the IMF advice on the capital flows, whether the IMF has the diversity of thought within the institution when it comes to this particular thing, or is the institutional set up there to keep promoting diversity of thought, different views on this so we can have better debate? It might be something you might have touched in the report or not, but here's a question, but the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much uh, to, to uh, Hans and Ella Ole for uh, these very interesting perspectives uh, on our report. Of course, Hans uh, was sort of part of the team, so to sp uh, speak, and uh, s gave a very nice view of what he found in his uh, background paper. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm in agreement with, with much of what was said. I just want to uh, take on a couple of points. I think with, I think Anela is right that we don't quite, we're not quite there yet in terms of having uh, a model that sort of fully grapples with uh, the, the capital account and, and uh, takes on board the fact that uh, countries are living in a very different world from kind of Mundell Fleming and thinking of the current account and then the capital account just being kind of the flip side of that. I think we've tried hard to incorporate many types of uh, financial flows, financial sec better modeling of financial sectors and the risks and the challenges that come from that, but we're not there yet. And I think the IPF, the Integrated Policy Framework, represents the best we have at this point of uh, trying to put together uh, our thoughts on, on what the challenges are that face countries. Um, but I, I agree that this is, this is a work in progress and it need, need, needs to continue. I think the IMF uh, was at the forefront of theoretical advances along the time of the adoption of the institutional view. I think it fell behind, but now I think with the integrated policy framework, it's, it's sort of back back in a, in, a, in, a, in a leadership position, and that needs to continue. Um, on distributional consequences uh, that Ole uh, challenged, and I think that, that that's a good challenge, and I think uh, many within the institution at the IMF also ask whether this is something that the IMF needs to get into. Uh, I, I just think that there is no choice. I think the distributional consequences of all kinds of policies are just front and center. And to ignore them is to just store up trouble for later. I mean, just think of what has happened in Chile. You think that this was a, you know, a star pupil of the Washington consensus, and the uh, lack of attention to inequality just stored up trouble for later. Think of the protest in France against, you know, against the the the, the, the regulations on on climate change. I mean, people care deeply about the fairness of policies. And they care deeply about the fairness of trade and financial globalization. So I think it would be good to say, yes, we can have this neat segmentation where the IMF worries about this set of issues and somebody else worries about the distribution. But I think that's a recipe for disaster. And that's the, that's the background in which uh, we have put these issues front and center in our report. I do agree with you that our, our treatment of uh, source country issues is somewhat light touch. I think, uh, you know, honestly, uh, um, it's not clear what we could say that really would uh, make a difference, to be honest. Uh, I did a previous report on IMF advice on unconventional monetary policies. There we did go in the direction of saying, look, we really need uh, to have some kind of code of conduct and so on. And we got quite a bit of pushback. I think this time we, re we advocated something that I think is actually more practical in the sense of countries getting together and thinking about the securities regulation that would allow for you know more uh, stability in flows to emerging markets so i think that's a better suggestion uh, than uh, the code of conduct which is a, a good suggestion in principle but is just not getting support uh, within the global community uh, so uh, oh on, on the diversity of thought i think uh, honestly on on on, on these particular issues, I don't think the problem is um, 
lack of diversity of thought. In fact, I think the IMF, as I said, was quite adventurous in its thinking uh, around 2010, 2012, the papers that you know, Jonathan Ostry, Rex Ghosh, Mevash Qureshi, and so on did were, were kind of ahead of their time in terms of theory. So I think it's I think the IMF has, at least in this area, been been a pioneer in not sticking to ortho, orthodox thinking. And I think the integrated policy framework is again revealing that it's not it's not lack of diversity of thought that is a barrier uh, in this particular area. It may be in, in other areas. Uh, let me stop there and see if, if others have other questions or want to speak up as well. I mean, we are only the five minutes overdue, but may I go uh, oh, a few more minutes overdue to take a few questions? Uh, I, uh, can I ask a question? I'm Nandalal Virasinga uh, from Sri Lanka. Please. I, uh, this, <clears throat> yeah, very briefly, uh, uh, my uh, question and comment uh, to Prakash, and thank you very much for a very useful paper. I think uh, I learned a lot from that. One um, first question, um, I think uh, Hans' presentation, he mentioned on this new uh, integrated policy framework uh, and also past institutional framework, some of the countries uh, have already mentioned that if they don't suit to their conditions, then they will just advise, uh, you know, ignore the advice. I think that that's kind of a, a important uh, statement. But when it comes to uh, uh, some countries can afford to have this ignoring that advice, especially when it comes to article of consultation and with the, you know, countries, those who are intend to borrow, especially after this COVID-19, there will be a lot of countries who need to borrow. When you have an institutional framework, which has some uncertainties in terms of implementation and in program negotiations, I think it's going to be a major constraint, especially given the IMF uh, kind of uh, the, the institutional uh, views are basically there's no flexibility for the staff, the area department staffs to deviate from essential view and when they are how do you I mean, that I see as a major constraint in borrow for the borrowing countries when you have a answer like for example now exchange rate volatility how you define this uh, what is the disorderly uh, movement of exchange rate and what are the uh, kind of uh, clear demarcation of CFM and, and uh, the macroprudential uh, that's one thing I, although the fund has I mean you have made a good contribution and fund has made uh, uh, move in the right direction, but still, I think there needs to be a flexibility in implementation when it comes to borrowing. Right, especially countries negotiating program. That's one point. Second, a uh, small clarification, uh, Prakash. In your presentation, you mentioned uh, some of the advanced countries when they, uh, you know, use uh, capital flow management uh, CFM measures to prevent housing, you know, maintain the affordability issue of the housing, like Australia, New Zealand, all these countries. I was wondering, uh, uh, is affordability for residents is more of a social issue? Didn't they raise the, this as a, a housing price bubble or something like that? Is more relevant to a uh, macro potential uh, side of the policy making rather than the, the social issue of affordability? I think, uh, because even historically, this. Uh, Housing uh, price, uh, you know, asset price bubble, so housing price bubble, could probably be the reason for this uh, uh, the capital management issues in housing uh, uh, mortgage markets in some of the NAS countries. Those are already capital, uh, you know, liberalized. My question is whether whether you uh, in your survey whether these countries did not mention uh, that that element other than only the, the social issue of uh, housing affordability. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Virasinghe. Um, so uh, on, on the first question, yeah, I mean, indeed, this is a sort of a long-standing uh, concern that country authorities have, namely that uh, IMF advice in, in program cases uh, can, you know, IMF has, has greater leverage over uh, over countries in, in in a program setting than than in surveillance. Uh, I mean, the only thing I would say there is that I think that 
for the institutional view, I don't think that. Uh, I mean, it, it's 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 a surveillance uh, tool and one that is being applied to the vast majority of the membership. And as what our uh, survey found, it's we didn't go deeply into into program versus surveillance cases, but we did have some program cases within our sample, and. I think the, the the feeling was that the IMF was trying to be consistent and even-handed, and I don't think that there was a sense that the IMF was using uh, the program status as a way of pushing countries towards uh, liberalization. So there may be the odd uh, hint here or there. I think uh, we did do some studies of Bangladesh and Sri Lanka also, which we did not end up reporting on. And, uh, there was some 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 hints in that direction, but it was not the predominant thing. And what I would say there is that the next year the IMF is going to review the institutional view. So this is really an opportunity for country authorities to make their voices heard, particularly from this region. And I think that's why this webinar is so valuable to us: is that uh, as the IMF thinks about how it's going to revise the institutional view, uh, the fact that folks in this region particularly have very strong views about the flexibility that is needed. Uh, I think that is something that can uh, play, play a big role in, in how the IMF ends up revising uh, the institutional view. On your second question, I think you're, uh, you're right. I, I, I stress the, uh, the, the housing affordability and uh, social motives a bit too much. Indeed, um, in, in uh, all five countries that we surveyed, uh, th there was also uh, concern about housing price bubbles. Um, I stress the social issue because uh, in many of these countries, it had gone from becoming a, uh, an issue that was confined to the financial uh, circles and to the financial elite to actually, uh, you know, the, the common people saying, uh, foreigners buying up houses is making houses less affordable for us. So it had become a, a kind of a very uh, political and sensitive issue for these countries. And you're right that Canada and so on were taking steps anyway for, for macro prudential reasons, as you were saying, to kind of prevent housing bubbles. But it had gone beyond that. And it was something that they really needed, they felt they needed to take action on. And the institutional view is just not flexible enough at the point to admit that countries could be taking these steps, namely capital controls, for uh, other considerations such as housing affordability. Uh, thanks very much again for your questions, Mr. Virasinghe. Thank you very much, for Deputy Governor Virasinghe, for questions. Mangal Goswami from Wait. the CSAN Center has a question, I believe. Sorry, and I'll be. We will I'll need very... to go to Hans Kenberg, who wants to make comments about Ole and Anela's remarks. Okay, I'll be very brief. Uh, thanks, Prakash. Good to see you. Uh, very quickly, I. I mean, maybe this is too simplistic a view, but uh, there is a reason why practice is fleeting, I guess, because over the last decade, there has been a tectonic shift in the nature and risk profile of, of capital flows to emerging markets and financial markets and, and, and frontier markets, uh, including Sri Lanka, right? As Anella pointed out, the risk profile has changed quite significantly in terms of the role of non-bank financial institutions, the asset managers, the uh, role of US dollar funding, the role of the US dollar swap market, massive shifts. And this plays into the exchange rate in a much more uh, vigorous way, which makes the macro financial amplification much more severe and the tails much more fatter. And therefore, policy frameworks have to adjust yeah. to it and cut the tails. So, I mean, it's just a simple sort of way of looking at this issue as to how policies can evolve. So that was just my comment, uh, um, uh, basically. Thank you, Prakash. Yeah, if I could uh, very quickly respond, I, th I think I think you said you said uh, much more eloquently and clearer what I had in mind when I said that kind of you know treating the issue as kind of a capital flow issues rather than a current account issue it, it is really a kind of a work in progress. And I think this is a good uh, time to mention that 
some of the work that the IMF is doing, which is kind of this capital flow at risk uh, work that uh, Tobias, Adrian, and others are doing, I think I think has a better uh, potential for for getting at some of the factors that you and Anela mentioned, namely, you know, how is it how can policies sort of cut off the tails, as you were mentioning, of of you know having you know having crises and uh, you know booms that, that which is what policymakers are worried about. So I think that the capital flows at risk is is really a, a big development uh, at, at the fund, and and it's it's part of the integrated policy framework work that 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 has has I think has great potential. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mangal. Hans? Yes, thank you. I just want to make a couple of remarks related to what Danella and Nola mentioned. Danella mentioned the difficulties of modeling nonlinearities and so on, and all the talk, all they talked about implementation. And my remarks is, is basically to read uh, the comments or that uh, Governor Veratai and Governor uh, De Gregoria had in our in our recent webinar on the um, IPF. Uh, Governor Veratai said, for an exchange intervention and capital flow management measures are important components in the integrated policy framework. The spillover uh, financial flows are volatile and large relative to the size of the financial markets in emerging markets and could trigger snowballing effects on exchange rate, which lead to more capital inflows. So he, he is worried, uh, that was recently after he was governor, but I'm sure he was worried when he was a governor about what he implicitly mentions about hurting effects of capital flows and, and non-linearities non that Danella mentioned. Uh, Jose mentioned something about implementation, Jose de Gregorio. He said, the integrated policy framework needs to have clear targets. We must specify our objectives are, what they are, our objectives are and how the instruments we are using will achieve these objectives. I think that's an important consideration uh, when we uh, contemplate the IPF with more instruments and how you integrate them together. We need to make sure that we're not talking about you know, for targeting exchange rate or targeting capital flows, but it's all uh, according to uh, De Gregorio. It's about providing financial monitor stability by using more tools. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Anyone like to give a one final view in less than half a minute? because we are well over time. Thank you to Prakash for a great uh, opportunity to listen to, uh, to the, his presentation of the uh, overall report. I thought, uh, and uh, also just personally, thanks for being uh, asked to be part of the process. It was very interesting. No, that, well, uh, thanks to all of you. And, and I, I want to just emphasize that um, Next year, the IMF revises its institutional view. Uh, the views from uh, this region are, are obviously going to be critical, and I think CSIN can play, ASP can play a big role in channeling those views to the IMF. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much on that win to Prakash and our colleagues in Washington, D.C. at the IMF and the Independent Evaluation Office in particular for making this happen and joining us. May I finish with a small anecdote from the times when Anela Munro and I, I were both at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Our governor from 15 years ago described the policy making at the central bank as, as if you need to drive in the middle of your lane. You make sure you don't shift to the other lane. You slow down when you come to sharp corners. One of our colleagues challenged him and said, well, I think the policy should be about make sure to make sure your engine doesn't blow up and you don't have a major accident. I think the capital flows are more in the vein of that letter and we are moving in that direction. I believe it's the right move and uh, the IOS report is a wonderful uh, move in that, as, as well as the, the IPF and all that capital flows at risk tail stuff. And I think we are moving in the right direction. And 
With that, I would like to thank all our speakers and also the senior policymakers and everyone else who joined us this morning or tonight, depending on where you are. Thank you and do stay safe.